This is episode number 134 of the Guns Magazine podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting folks who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. But first, before we get started, let's have a quick chat about our sponsor, Luth AR. Luth AR is home of MBA buttstocks, which are affordable, lightweight, fully adjustable buttstocks for your AR-15 fixed and collapsible rifles. But that's not all. Luth AR is your one-stop shop for build kits, replacement parts, and custom accessories, including the chubby grip, palm hand guards, oversized switch safety, and paddle bolt catch. Luth AR is proudly made in the USA, and with four decades of experience, they'll continue their mission of innovate to dominate with high-quality products for your ARs. Find out more at LuthAR.com. Unfortunately, today's talk isn't really fun, but it is important. As we've had another rash of mass homicide incidents, I got together with Roy Huntington to talk about the real-world stuff you and your family need to do to survive an active shooter incident. Now here's my talk with Roy Huntington. Well, good Friday morning, Roy. Happy Friday. (laughs) People (laughs) often wonder how far in advance we record these, and hey, it's Friday morning. (laughs) Uh, Technically working, I suppose. Yes, yes. Well, it's this is not a happy topic we're going to talk about, but it, I think it's an important topic. And you look at current events that have happened uh, this week, not too far from you, Roy. There was a uh, a shooting at a medical office, and then of course the yep. uh, week before there was the uh, terrible tragedy in uh, West Texas. And it's unfortunate when you look in the mass media that there are so many people offering suggestions and advice and ideas, and they don't have the first clues to what they're talking about. So I thought the two of us, retired old guys, retired cops, maybe we could offer some opinions and maybe even something that might help somebody if you're ever confronted by what we call mass shooter, mass homicide, active shooter, and all those highly technical names they try to throw on top of somebody that's going to go kill a whole bunch of people. I I have no idea what the hell's going on in the world, and I and there's nothing I can do about it, uh, other than let's you and I help people we know at least prepare to be able to do the best they can in a situation like that. I think exactly. that's really the only thing we can do. Yep. You know, we're not going to talk about gunfighting and knife fighting and ninju jitsu disarmament techniques. And all. Let's talk about what really will save you, which is. Don't stand there and watch your own death. Don't you think that whether you're talking a mass shooter, you're talking just interpersonal violence or even just a tragedy. Don't you think from your experience as a cop, that's what happens. People stand there and watch it happen. You know, I, I'm afraid I had to laugh because just before we started, you know, we were chatting about, well, you know, gosh, what are we going to talk about and stuff? And I asked you, you know, what, what do you think you're going to cover? And you said, I want to make sure that they understand that they need to do something Yep. You know, make a decision. And I, I laugh because it's exactly what I was wanted to focus on, too, because you and I have both seen it. And I mean, I've come up to countless situations where there's somebody sitting on the curb and they're holding a bloody handkerchief to their forehead. And yeah. some bad guy had just knocked him in the head with a street brick yep. and robbed his, you know, his man purse. <laughs> and the first thing they say is, well, I couldn't believe it was really happening. Yep. You know. Yep. So rather than acting and reacting, they were standing there going, I can't believe this is really happening. And I think that's the number one violation because the average Sam and Susie homemaker out there, they don't have any training. You know, you and I have faced bad guy with guns and been beat up and stuff. And so for a lot of these people, this is maybe the first time they've ever actually seen a real gun or heard an actual gunshot. And so they just freeze up. Yep. It, it's funny uh, talking to people, and I'm sure you've you've heard this too, is people always go, it's not like TV. I think people think they understand what violence and, you know, all this ugliness is about because they've all seen it. All, they've seen every possible permutation of, of this kind of stuff on TV. But then when it actually happens to them, they'll say, well, it's not it's not like TV. No kidding. 
guns don't go bang. <laughs> they are so loud yeah. and they have a big boom and and bullets don't make sparks when they hit the <laughs> wall and bullets don't go zing when they go by you. They go snap, yep. <laughs> you know, and I agree with you. And you bring up a very good point, I think, which is maybe if there's a way that people just need to be acclimated, you know, may, maybe there's maybe there is a market for what do we call it? Range training for people who don't want to go there to learn to shoot. Mm-hmm. But why don't you come here and we're going to let you shoot a gun a couple of times. We're going to let you hear gunfire. We're going to put you behind the berm and let you know what it sounds like to have bullets go flying by. And then that way, when it happens, you like, go, oh, okay, I've, you know, I've done this, Yep. you know, so now let's think about how do I get my family out of here? Yeah, I was laying in bed this morning thinking about this talk we're having, and I had to laugh to myself. Well, I, I'll say I'll, I'll laugh for you, Roy, because we both have very strong-willed brides. They're they're not shirking violets. And I'm sure that you've done the same thing I have, which is, if I ever turn to you and say, we have to leave now, our spouses understand they're not going to stand there. Going, well, we just got here. What's going on? I want to go look at, you know, whatever. They understand yeah. if you use that tone of voice, it's time to leave. And that kind of goes back to that whole idea of make a decision and do something. So the point being here is make sure your family, as you were talking about, understands if I say we're going right now, we have to go right now. No discussion, no argument. Something's going on that the rest of you haven't realized yet. And we need to have an understanding that you just got to follow me and we'll talk about it later. Well, you know, when you hear that boom and you see somebody at the other end of the room and they've got a rifle or a gun or something. It, you, somehow we have to make people understand you have to make that leap from disbelief yep. to just accept the fact it's really happening. And so yeah. now make a decision. You know, I found in my career as a policeman, almost always, if a good guy fights back against a bad guy, you know, like in a street robbery or mm-hmm. something like that, I mean, way more often than not, things usually go pretty well for the good guy. Usually, yeah. Because the bad guy goes, oh, oh, wait, I didn't expect anyone to actually fight back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I thought this was going to be easy. So uh, I, I think just the fact that people would would move and react mm-hmm. and run to the door might surprise these people, you know, but boy, you, you know, you see people and they, they hunker down on the ground and cower in place. Yep. That's why there's a lot of different active shooter trainings for schools and a couple of the most popular ones. They do say, you know, run, fight, but they also say hide. And I would almost say that's, you know, you can't war game every situation, but, and I understand we're talking about age appropriateness, but when we're talking to adults, hiding should be so far down your list as to never really enter into your thinking. If you're not fighting or you're not running anything else, unless you're just trapped in a windowless concrete room and you have no other way out, you know, otherwise there's probably a window, a door, a ceiling, something, bash something open, kick a door open, you know, break a window, but get out of there. And if things turn out to be not what you thought they were, well, okay, you may have to pay for a window, but I just, it makes me, uh, upset when I, when I see people talking about, well, just, just hide and, and be quiet. Well, Okay, it, it may be in that one circumstance, but man, that would be a point zero one percent of my action plan for something like this. That's the last resort for sure. I think you know we're all so conditioned to behave and do what we're told. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've actually read about situations where people were would have fear, would have been able to escape, except they were afraid to push the door open because it had the bell on it. Yeah, you know. Yep. Or, I, I, you know, there's any, it's like, first thing I might do is go and bash. There's a fire alarm right there. Good. Bash it mm-hmm. and get the sprinklers going, yep. <laughs> you know, I mean, just start throwing wrenches in the fire here. Yep. And let's, you know, let's like you say, pick up everybody, pick up chairs and throw them, you know, and yeah. uh, you know what they tell you if you're, if you're being stalked by a cougar is you make yourself big, mm-hmm. you know, put your arms up and yell at them and stuff like that. And I think these guys, that's what they are. They're cougars and they don't expect people to fight back. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's why they don't go to places that say to everyone here is well-armed and trained and we're <laughs> going to fight back. You know, yeah. 
they go where they say, you know, there's no guns. I, and I don't want to get off on a rant here, but I just saw today in Ohio that I guess I, they're pending that's where legislation. I was yeah. Yep. And and it said one guy was interviewed and he said, I was unable to find a single teacher who was comfortable with having guns <laughs> in the school. And I thought, how is that possible? That's not possible. <laughs> that's, you know, that's the Associated I mean, it, Press for you. Yeah. How many teachers at, at the at the latest incident would have done anything to have had a gun in their hand at that moment when they exactly. knew they could have fought back? You well, know, and I'm going to be crude here, but I've been saying this for years. You arm teachers and have them go through training because they're in a, a different type of environment, but have them go through training background checks. I don't have a problem with that, but arm some of them and you shoot a couple of these little SOBs in the face and the only body count would be the suspect. This stuff would stop right now. These folks generally can do what they do with impunity, and sometimes they end it by their own hand. It, it's been interesting. The last couple of years, they're finding now more of these shooters are not killing themselves because, you know, they they enjoy the notoriety or whatever. I say we solve that problem for them, but I, I feel pretty strongly about that. You shoot a couple of them, knock them out, and the next guy that's planning something like this, and there's always one out there, he might think twice about it. But does, it, does that make too much sense, Roy? No, I've seen interviews with suspects and they say, well, I didn't go there because I knew those people would probably fight back. Yeah. Cool. Hello. <laughs> you know, well, it's like the old I joke, you don't insane... rob a cop bar. <laughs> no, well, yeah. You know, <laughs> although there's a good story about that, which we'll have to tell someday. <laughs> but the when I was in San Diego, there was a school shooting. And this was, I don't remember exactly when it was, late 80s, I think, or maybe early 90s. And some Looney Tune kid was pissed off and he, you know, got a gun and he went to his local high school. Well, by a miracle of coincidences, there was an off-duty cop was there about to have a parent-teacher meeting. And he was armed, right? Yeah. And he shot this guy, right, before everything got out of hand. And it was kind of played down. And, you know, no one really said, you know, oh, oh gosh, policemen shouldn't be armed on, you know, on schools. Although there are people who say that, which oh, amazes yeah. me. But, uh I mean, everyone just assumed, well, gosh, it was a good thing there was a good guy with a gun. No one made the leap to say, well, if that works so well, why don't why didn't we have armed people there anyway, like Israel does? And, yep. You know, some other places. There hasn't been a school shooting in Israel in 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because they have armed people in the schools. You yep. know? Um, well, and, and another rant I can go off on is, um, you know, in, in my career. Uh, I was a certified uh, what we call crisis intervention team member, which meant I got more training on mental illness. So I was one of the guys when we had folks that were having some kind of emotional or mental breakdown, they would call me and I would deal with them. We had different things we could do with them. But I have a little bit of background here. And let me say, all these quote unquote experts that the media is talking to that says, let's not make this about mental illness. Horse crap. Straight up horse crap. We as a a world need to rise up and say, I get that you're trying to be an advocate for those with mental illness, but you've never seen one of these school shooters or a workplace shooter that they interview later, their neighbors or later, and they go, oh, yeah, he was a real well-adjusted guy, happy-go-lucky, you know, uh, mowed his yard all the time, or these kids, you know, they were the, I, I've yet to see the valedictorian or the homecoming king do any of that stuff. It's always these people that have all kinds of problems. And, you know, I'm not going to get into why they have the problems. Uh, that's unfortunate. And they need all the help we can give them. But when they get to the point, they're ready to commit violence and, and murder people. They don't deserve any consideration whatsoever. And yes, they have mental illness. Well, the, you got to be nuts to do what these people do. <laughs> and I by think definition, we're rapid... Most of us get that. Yeah. And, and we're rapidly at a point approaching a point we're at that's now to where it, we have to stop coddling them mm -hmm. and we have to start protecting ourselves from them yep. you know and I, i'm painting it with a broad brush i got it you yeah. know but the but you and i both know how many times have you been in the field with your partner and you make contact with somebody and in about a second and a half you look at your partner and you both know exactly what you're talking about yep which is okay this guy's loony yeah you know He's dressed in a business suit. He has a briefcase. He's about to unlock the door of his BMW. But you and your partner both know that this guy is <laughs> trouble. And I don't know. Well, you know, I like to go on record and say, I personally would donate 
as much of my free retired policeman time as the local school district would want. And I would be willing to go spend one day a week, half a day a week, doesn't matter what, at you pick out the school in my area, every elementary school, every high, doesn't matter what, right? And all I am is walking around in my jacket and with the, my baseball cap on that says John Deere, you know, <laughs> and I'm just there. Yep. And then you can let the word out and just say every one of our schools is occupied by an unknown number of retired police officers. That would be great. <laughs> who have nothing to lose <laughs> and would love to shoot a bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> I would do that. And yeah. everyone you and I know would do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? And it just seems so easy because people say, oh, no, then, but you need extra training and sensitivity training. No, you don't. No, no, no. <laughs> it's like, and, you know, that was one change I saw during my career. And I, I think you did, too, is when we started training for these kind of things, using our simulators and all that, you know, typically it was, you know, you start with the B7 silhouette, but then now we get down to these uh, computer generated ones and we actually started seeing young people. I mean, like 14 year olds in these simulations because we had to get it through our cops heads that it probably won't be that, you know, 40 year old, long haired, greasy, dirty biker guy. It may be some <laughs> dweeby little 14 year old that, you know, is carrying that rifle down the hallway. And point being is shoot him. You just got to shoot him. You know, you, you deal with the aftermath afterwards. But if he's there trying to kill people, your job is to solve his problem. It is that it's what we're we're you're so right, though, about the the you know greasy biker meth head guy, yeah. you know, holding the gun. And when that's the guy we would always shoot at, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, on the targets. And you're right. I saw the transition to, you know, pregnant lady holding up <laughs> exactly. pistol. You know, Elderly you think, women. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but it did teach you that it's like it, your targets are not what you may expect. I know it's like every time you, you talk to a, one of our readers or something and their, their home defense situation is they're going to wake up at nighttime. They're going to go out into the hallway. There'll be a bad guy standing there holding a knife up 12 to 15 feet away. <laughs> the lights will be on. <laughs> yeah. He'll be holding still and you're going to shoot him. And he's going to fall down. Mm -hmm. Right. And we 2. all know 5 that. shots in 2.5 yeah, seconds. And that's just not how it is. It's like you say, it's going to be some 14 year old one eyed guy who's a deaf mute. Yeah. You know, holding a, a pump action shotgun. Yep. And it's like, well, now what do I do? You know, so. Well, we kind of got off on the, the a rant, so, so to speak. But I actually had a topic or a related point with this mental illness thing is, again, when people have done this stuff. And, you, and they go back and they always investigate their their living situation, their friends, their family. And nowadays, especially social postings. So you've got family saying this guy's a nutcase. Maybe HR or the uh, school have dealt with this person and they're, and they're afraid of him. And, you know, maybe you work next to this guy and all he talks about, I can't wait to come in and kill everybody here. Folks, you got to say something. You got to say something. And what do people always say? Well, I didn't want to cause them Good problems. Point. Yep. Really? Yep. Good point. Imagine yep. if one of that kid's friends, if he had any friends in Texas, had seen some of those social media posts and, and called the local police or the local school and said, look, I think this guy's off his noodle and I think he's getting ready to do something. OK, imagine you could have saved a whole bunch of young kids lives and all it takes that, is telling somebody. And, and that, yeah, that and that goes back to what we started the show with, which was. You have to admit that something's happening. Yep. And so I think people say they see that and they think, oh, no, it's probably OK. Oh, he's having a bad day. Yeah, oh, he's just, he's, you know, just talking. Yeah, he's just talking. That's nothing. But you're right. It's somehow we have to spur people on to take the action. I mean, how many times when you were a policeman, did you respond to like a, a domestic call or a child abuse call in a home or something like that? And you interview the neighbors and they say exactly that. Yep. They say, you know, we were always worried. The children were always coming over here and they were always hungry. And so we yep. always fed them. And I would always say, well, why didn't you call the police? Well, you know, we were afraid to be involved and we were, you know, yep. so it's like, yeah, yeah, we somehow we need to make people understand you have to break through that. And so, like you say, if your neighbor's acting crazy, then you need to call the police and say, my neighbor's acting crazy. Yep. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And then, and don't take no for an answer either. You yeah. know, if the cops try to blow you off for some reason, be demanding. Yeah. You know? Yep. 
And and for the parents of school age kids, if your kids are telling you at dinner, oh yeah, Jimmy, you know, lives next block over, man, he's nuts. He was talking about killing cats and setting fire to the school. And you need to investigate that. That's not you know, teen angst or rebellion. That's a kid that's at least thought about doing this stuff. And unfortunately, in talking to my friends at our school, police officers, um, I just ran into a couple of them the other day. and We had a nice long talk about the world. And they said to a certain subset of kids, and this is hard for me to wrap my head around, is school shooters are like heroes. I mean, we've seen that with like the Columbine guys, you know, people always cite them as an inspiration. That's not just like one or two crazy kids in the United States. That's like a small group at every school. And they we have raised this culture that they think that's kind of their way to gain <laughs> gain notoriety or something. But, you know, instead of like working hard, getting a good job, you know, being the president of the chess club, hey, it's better I'll steal, steal a gun and go kill everybody. And those kids are in your school. I don't care if you're in East... East Joplin or, you know, South Bumfrey or downtown L.A., those kids are in your kids' schools. Absolutely. It's just they haven't hit their trigger point. So when they get close, you're going to hear about it. Somebody's going to hear about it. you got to do something. you got to say something. You know, when they all play these uh, first-person shooter video games. Exactly. Training to kill. Yeah, and I've read a lot of of, uh, scientific work where, I mean, there's a lot of it. I think it depends on how the kids are hardwired to some kids. It's a video game. They play it and then they go back and finish their homework, Mm -hmm. right? They know it has no bearing on reality. They have no desire to act out on it, but there is the crazy ones like you and I are talking about who they do that first person shooter video game. And they go, well, I want to, I want to feel this for real. Mm -hmm. I want to do this for real, you know? And then naturally we're school, right? (laughs) You, You hate all the people at school. You hate the bullies. And there you go. Well, I think, I mean, the most important thing that we're talking about so far, I think, is the fact that people have to train themselves to acknowledge that a situation is happening. I mean, I, I've beat this into readers' heads over the years where people want to talk about, oh, what's the best home defense gun? And the yeah. first thing I always say is... Which load should I carry? Yeah. and the, But the first thing I always say is, do you have a big fire extinguisher next to your bed? Not the little tiny little one pound, you know, <laughs> dry, but like the, you know, the big ones. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, they're 40 or 50 bucks at Home Depot, the kind you can actually really put a fire out. I said, do you have one of those next to your bed? Virtually everyone says, no. Oh, uh, I think I have one in the kitchen, mm-hmm. I think, right? And I always tell them, well, chances are better that you're going to have to fight your way out of your bedroom in a fire yep. than to have to engage some crazy biker in your hallway. Yeah. Right? And they go, oh, I never thought of that before. Gosh. And I've had a lot of them come back and send me a picture. Look, here's my fire extinguisher next to my bed. But that's the thinking. If people are willing to to react and act like that and to train about a fire drill at home, then they need to be training about this kind of stuff. Like you say, take your family out to the local Kmart or something and just say, okay, we're going to pretend right now that there's something going on in this store. So let's leave. Yep. You know? And and practice that. Practice, you know, walking fast and exiting. You know, or yep. or tell your four kids or your two kids and say, tell me where the nearest exits are. Mm-hmm. Make them look around. Make them think about it. You know. Yep. And uh, there's well, nothing that, wrong that with that. That goes into my final point of it, it, we're going to get super technical here now, uh, since this is a how to. But observe and plan. You know okay. how many folks. When you get on an airplane, I, I'm sure you do it. I do. How many how many rows to the emergency exit in front of me and behind me? You know, and that's the Absolutely. safest manner of transportation there is. But I've heard from enough people that have been in aircraft incidents. You know, it's smoky, maybe upside down. People are screaming. You, you know, you're totally disoriented. But at least you should be able to remember five rows forward, five rows forward. But people don't do that, especially when they're in comfortable surroundings. If they're at work, where's the nearest exit? Where's the nearest backup exit? You know, um, if if a, somebody comes in shooting, where do you think they're going to come from? And I know it sounds a little, I think people don't want to do that because it sounds morbid, but you got to stop and think of, okay, if it, there's the HR office down the hallway, that's a good location where people may start doing something stupid. If that happens, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to be like a scared little bunny and run out the other way. And 
you know, if it turns out to be somebody dropped a stapler and it sounded like a gunshot and you run out and set off the emergency alarm and you're standing outside feeling like, like an idiot. So, oh, well, I give you a gold star for that, because if it had exactly. been real, you didn't you wouldn't have had a second chance. But just think about this stuff. Look around you, plan, figure out how you're going to get out there and also figure out if you have to fight, what do you have at hand now in. In gunwriter lore, of course, we've all got a Master Blaster 5000 with extended magazines and optic sights and, you know, yeah, whatever. I know so many folks that work in places where they can't carry because they'll be fired. And some choose to do it anyway. A lot of them don't. But I said, you've got plenty. There is so much stuff. If you've ever taken an improvised weapons course or you've been a cop and seen the various ways people have been injured over the years, even a typewriter can be a lethal weapon if you've got the strength to hoist it. You know, and most people we know have never been in a fight. Yeah. You know, and so I know when I teach people to shoot here, one of the once I get them familiar with a gun, then I put a target up at about three yards and I make them scream at the target. Get out of my house. Mm -hmm. I hate you. Leave now. Put the weapon down. And so the first thing they go, they go, hey, could you would you leave, please? Not. Uh, (laughs) And then I so finally, though, after a few times and you get them really screaming and yelling and spitting yep. and you know and their face is red and then they shoot four or five shots into the target and i can see afterwards i've had them tell me they say you know what i've never done anything like that in my life and now yep. i'm not afraid to do it yep you know? Um, you, you know i just thought of something that we've never talked about but i guarantee you, you've seen it roy i guarantee every cop and former cop in our audience that has ever helped train at the academy or been an instructor is when you get the new recruits out for the first day of what we call scenario training. You give them a blue gun or empty gun, and and you send them to a staged domestic or a traffic stop or whatever. And if things start going sideways real fast, you will always see at least a couple of the recruits that will almost literally be chased through the yard with a machete, and they'll be going, sir, 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 stop, sir, (laughs) sir, stop, stop, sir, (laughs) sir, stop. I mean, I've literally, when we were doing traffic stops, we've stolen the police car before because they're standing, sir, sir, get out of my car, sir, stop pointing the gun at me. Those are cops. They're, They're baby cops. They're not, well, they're not even baby cops. They're still recruits. But if they do it, John and Susie Citizen, you know, that's what you're up against. It's that whole mindset of you put a veteran cop in that situation. It's going to hand, be hands on real fast. But they're so uh, not used to violence that, that, sir, sir, stop, sir, sir, please, sir, sir, sir. Well, in the real world, you bad things would have happened. So you have to get in that mindset, like you said, that this is real. This is not TV. It's not a game. It's real, and you have to solve the problem for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. Well, you know, Wyatt Earp once said uh, the reason why he he won his fights is because he had already made the decision to shoot the gun before the fight started. He knew what he was going to do, and most people don't. You know, so most people, it's like, they're surprised. I can't believe it's really happening, and then they'll think about, what do I do now? Do I shoot my gun? Do I not? Am I in trouble if I do? Should I? Should I? Am I in trouble if I break the fire alarm and I make, which by the way, is a good idea to do because that lets other people in the building know that there's something going on Yeah, and they're conditioned that when they hear the fire alarm, what do they do? They leave leave the building. Yep. (laughs) You know, it's automatic. Right. So, but yeah, yeah, people need to get over that. And and it's like, you've seen a group and I hate to see bringing up the cop stuff, but it's experience is if there's four or five cops standing around some guy and a guy starts to get physical, what happens? All of the cops (laughs) will move toward him and jump on him and restrain him. Yep. Right. Yep. If you have a new cop or a trainee, they like usually are standing there all by themselves while the three veteran cops are in a pile (laughs) on the bad guy. Right. (laughs) It's like, and you have to condition yourself of that. Um, I had a reader one time and actually I think he came up with a really good idea. Uh, He advocates that you issue these like really huge uh, steel nuts, like nut and bolt nuts. Okay. I mean, they're like just marginally smaller than a baby's fist, right? You know, and then he said- I'm so wondering where this is going. (laughs) No, he said you issue those to all the students and Ah. then a bag of them, right? (laughs) And everybody has them in their backpack. And then if anything ever happens, they have to be trained. You let it be, take them outside, you let them throw it at targets, right? <laughs> get the, to where then if something happens, geez, you know, you get 30 kids and they all let fly with one of these steel <laughs> nuts, right? Yeah. And I thought, yeah, okay, I know it's silly, but 
Interesting concept. If, you, if there you are and you're fighting back and this guy is not going to expect this. Yeah. And now you're pelting him with hard thrown. Can you imagine what a half a dozen college football players could do with a bag <laughs> full of steel nuts? You know? <laughs> so, uh, but I, I mean, I think it takes that kind of outside the box thinking. Of course, yeah. I'd rather see two or three retired cops walk in the hallways of, of, of some classroom there, but yep. let's put out that out and say, we would like to really avail ourselves of that. In other words, we would, I would be willing to participate in a program where if a school district wants to have this happen in their district that, you know, let's open that door. Let's, let's have a resource of retired police officers. Well, yeah. these guys don't do very much else. Right. Yeah. And you know, you get some guy in his late sixties, they're, they're still smart. They understand the law. They understand defense. They understand criminals. They understand all that stuff. And they won't and, hesitate. Uh, and they won't hesitate. I mean, they because what was the funnest thing I enjoyed doing when I was a policeman was putting handcuffs on a bad guy. Yep. And so how satisfying would it be to be at a school and stop something before it happens? You know? Yep. And exactly. while everyone else is wringing their hands and saying how awful it is that we have a gun in the you know classroom. Mm. We're past that point, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you know, it's the time horse to is fight out of the back. barn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's time to fight back, you know, so. Well, this has kind so of been a rambling go. uh episode, but I think we, I, I feel like we got our point across, which is when, you know, Steve Tarani, uh, one of our great uh, writers for AmericanCop.com, uh, he's got a whole series of things called Prefence, and he talks about, you know, like in the dignitary protection world, if you go to guns, you've lost. And... What we're talking about, yeah, if you got the gun and you're trained and you can do it, great, good for you. You get a double gold star for me, but you need to be thinking about that stuff beforehand, whether you got a gun and a knife or not. And it goes for your spouse and your family and all that stuff. Be thinking about it. Be ready to move. And then if you have to fight, you fight. And it's actually that simple. I hate to say it. It's one of those things, simple to do or simple to understand, but hard to do. But well, you know, when we were both young cops, I uh, bet you both of our, certainly my if field training officer did, yours probably did too, which they encourage us to play what if. Oh, absolutely. All the time. And, you know, what if that guy over there ran the red light? What if that guy over there started to hit that other guy? What if the child ran in the street? You know, whatever the, the situation is. And so for years when I was a policeman, all the while I was driving around, I would play, well, what if I got a call saying this was happening two mm -hmm. blocks away? What? How would I literally physically respond to that you know what yep. would i put it out on the radio first would i just go would i go code three would i not and so then when those things actually really happened you'd already run through the sort of paces a little bit yeah so it wasn't strange and so i i encourage everyone to just play what if you touched on it earlier the next time you go to your office if you're still doing that is as you pull into your office stop for a second and what if and say what would i do right now if i saw someone walking into the office with a rifle <laughs> What would I do? Yeah. Stop and think about it. Would I call 911? Would I run him over? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and think about it. And then after you get inside, stop and say, here I'm sitting at my desk. And if I hear gunshots in the lobby, what's my first move? Yep. And so just do it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I kind of chuckled there because I, I, I can't think of a personal experience, but I know it's happened where, well, my, that's strange. Why is that man carrying tactical gear and a rifle into the office? I better go in and see what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> wrong yeah. answer by by far so it's like what the horror you know yeah. i can't believe it's happening you know so exactly i think if people play what if and you know, you don't have to know the answer no you know you just have to be thinking about it and you can always research and find the answer and listen to shows like this and have dr google help you and say you know what are the top 10 things to remember if you're involved in an active shooter situation i mean go yep. ahead and learn but but at least get your brain going you know get Absolutely. the cobwebs out yeah, grease the skids a little bit. And so that way, when something happens, you're going to be the person taking action, you know, saving people, hitting the alarm, you know, throwing yeah. a chair at the bad guy while everyone else is standing around going, what's happening? Yep. Well, you know, you read about all the heroes on 9-11 that led people down the stairway. All they did yeah. was go, follow me. That's all it took because people are standing around. What do we do? What do we do? We don't know what to do. Follow mm -hmm. me. And by that simple act, you become a hero and you save lives. So, 
Well, Roy, well, I think we did good, Brent. I, seriously, I think so. I think I think if, so. If people I hope so. Think a little bit. And if folks have more questions, thoughts, comments, make sure you drop us an email or leave a comment below. And hopefully, you think about what's going on before it happens. So, Roy, thank you so much on this Friday. And uh, now I've got to get some editing done, muy pronto. But uh, I'll release you back into your gentleman farmer mode. <laughs> Retired them. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. It's always fun. This whole episode hasn't been a pleasant topic, but I hope we've given you some actionable intelligence to stay safe if the unthinkable ever happens to you. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first on the newsstand, and today we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got any questions or comments about the show, please email me. That would be editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory, YouTube, and of course you can always listen at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com, AmericanCop.com, and our numerous special editions available for sale on our websites. Most of all, while you're online, I'd also appreciate it if you would share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. Well, that's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Get shooting.